Here is a patient being log rolled in order to remove the spinal board. There are two ways of doing this. In a small non combative patient with a team of several people, a pat slide can safely transfer the child to the examination trolley. This is what is happening here. Note the hand positions of the team and remember that the person at the head end is in control of procedures. Instructions should be very clear. For example, we will roll on three. One, two, three. In a large or combative patient or a smaller team of helpers, it is better to lift the spinal board over, then perform the log roll on the examination couch, removing the spinal board at that stage. There are a variety of adjustable wrist splints on the market. People use the term Futura splint as a general description. Watch how the Velcro straps are adjusted for comfort. Thumb splints come with a rigid thumb extension, which is used for first metacarpophalangeal injuries and possible scaphoid fractures. A wrist splint can also be used for simple buccal or torus fractures of the distal radius. The scaphoid bone is located in what is known as the anatomical snuff box. This is the area outlined by extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. In other words, ask the patient to extend their thumb and you will see a groove. Feel the groove and as you work proximally, you will feel the border of the styloid process of the radius. If there is tenderness in the groove itself, in other words over the scaphoid bone, there may be a fracture. However, many patients have tenderness here because a branch of the radial nerve passes along here and pressure here hurts. Therefore, you need to do some more tests. In the clip, you first see the doctor testing the anatomical snuff box. Next, test the other aspect of the scaphoid bone, which is on the volar aspect of the wrist, just as you feel the edge of the styloid process of the radius run out. Tenderness in this groove is a more reliable sign than in the anatomical snuff box. Lastly, if you pull on the thumb, this pulls the first metacarpal and distracts the scaphoid fracture. Similarly, if you push in line with the metacarpal, this compresses the fracture. These two movements are known as telescoping the thumb. The doctor performs all of these tests. To examine the extensor tendons, you just need to ask the child to keep the finger out straight and not to let you bend it, as in this example. A fully torn tendon will cause the finger to droop. A partial tear will be more subtle, but there will be pain as the child tries to resist you pressing. Straight as you can and keep them really, really stiff and really fight me and don't let me press them down, okay? Really strong. Great. That's really good. There are two sets of flexor tendons and you have to examine these separately. Like with the extensor tendons, you need to test against resistance that is, you putting on pressure, if you're going to detect the more subtle partial tears. Watch how the doctor tests firstly the superficial flexor tendons, then the deep tendons, and listen to how she explains this to the child. Okay. You just let your fingers relax like that, and then we're going to practice bending instead. Okay, so if I hold those, can you bend your thumb over there? Now keep it in there really, really strong. Don't let me pull it really good okay same as that one bend it up right don't let me pull it down that's really good let's try that one that one bend it up right really strong that's good that one bend it up really strong great we're doing it over again now just bend up the tip really strong that's good let's try this one hang on a minute Put it down first. Right, now just do the tip. Brilliant. Down flat. Okay, just the tip. Very good. And then that one. Just the tip. Very good. Okay. When you test for nerve damage, you need to test both sensation and power. When you test sensation, do not ask if the child can feel you. This is not sensitive enough. You need to test for altered rather than totally absent sensation. Listen to how the doctor asks the question and watch as she tests the reliable nerve territories in the hand, in other words exactly where she is testing. This is important because there is a lot of overlap due to individual variation. 
He tests the radial nerve first, then the median, then the ulnar nerve. Okay, can I have a little look at your hand then, Amber? Can you tell me if it feels okay when I touch it? Okay, so when I touch there, do you think it feels like normal, or do you think it feels a bit funny or fuzzy? Just normal? Brilliant, okay. What about there? Normal? Fantastic. What about over here? That's just normal. In testing power, listen to the instructions she gives so the child can cooperate. Watch as she tests firstly the radial nerve, then the median, and lastly the ulnar nerve. Last thing I want you to do uh, is keep your hand out straight, okay, like that, and don't let me bend your hand at all. Really good. Fantastic. Yeah. What I want to now test is how strong you are doing other things, okay. I want you to do that with your finger, okay, and don't let me open it. Keep really strong. Brilliant. In between that finger and that finger, put your fingers out straight. Lift it up a little bit. Now you keep my fing my pen in your fingers and don't let me pull it out. Okay, that's very good. Okay. There are two ways to check for finger rotation. The first is to ask the child to close the fingers slowly into a fist and see if the finger looks twisted. The second is to see the fingers end on and look for any rotation. To reduce any dislocated joint, the general principles are disimpaction, which usually means extension, then reduction back to where the position should be. This is just the same in a dislocated proximal interphalangeal joint, which we see here. It helps to use gauze to prevent you slipping on the patient's skin. You see the doctor disimpact the bone ends, then applying firm pressure to push the joint back into position. You will usually need either Entonox or a digital block to achieve this. Remember to x-ray the joint afterwards. A mallet splint keeps the finger straight. It is used for small avulsion fractures of the distal interphalangeal joint. Look at the knee before you begin. Significant injuries cause an effusion, which you can see by loss of the normal grooves either side of the patella. Comparing with the normal side helps you spot a subtle effusion. Next, palpate to look for localised tenderness. Watch the doctor palpate the length of the medial collateral ligament, including the medial joint line in the middle. then the lateral collateral ligament, again conscious of palpating the lateral joint line in the middle. The fibula head and neck should also be palpated. Then she palpates the patella itself. Next, she tests if the patient can straight leg raise. Then she puts her own knee under the patient's and encourages him to relax his quadriceps muscle. The patient is often tense when in pain. This allows her to assess his collateral ligaments for laxity. The lateral collateral ligament is tested by holding the medial thigh still with one hand, while using the other hand to push the lower leg medially to see if there is any laxity across the joint line of the knee. The medial collateral ligament is stressed in the same way, changing her hand positions. Next, she tests the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments by sitting on the patient's foot and pushing and pulling the tibia using her hand flat on the anterior surface of the knee to help detect excessive AP movement caused by a lax cruciate ligament. A broad arm sling holds the elbow flexed at 90 degrees. Watch the order in which you should do this. A high arm sling elevates the hand to prevent swelling. This is important for keeping the fingers mobile and reducing pain. 
Watch the order in which you should do the various steps. The purpose of neighbour strapping is to give an injured finger the support of its next finger. We do this with two strips of tape, positioned as seen, to allow flexion and extension of the fingers. We also put a piece of gauze between the fingers to absorb moisture to prevent the skin rubbing. It's lovely, it's not too tight. <laughs> Okay, my day. That's all I'm going to do. All right? It's all done. The Bedford splint does the same thing as neighbour strapping, but is more comfortable and easier to take on and off. It simply holds the two fingers together, so the injured finger has some protection and support from its neighbour. A Zimmer splint keeps the finger straight. It is used for a variety of finger fractures, it gives more support than a simple neighbour strap. This technique for removing a foreign body in the nose is called the kissing technique and is more humane and less dangerous than holding the child down and using forceps and in some cases can avoid a general anaesthetic. Most children find it very funny. Listen to the explanation, then watch as the parent obstructs the clear nostril, then blows a short sharp puff into the child's mouth to expel the foreign body, in this case a pea, out of the other nostril. Sometimes you need to do it again to get the foreign body fully out. Then it's just going to blow in your mouth. It's going to give you a kiss kiss. Okay, so I'm going to hold this one. So it's not going to be it. So good seal around there, but don't push up against his nose right. with your lip. Sharp, short. Yay! Yay! This clip shows an eye with a corneal foreign body after local anaesthetic drops have been applied and the patient is on a slit lamp. The doctor holds a green needle perpendicular to the eye's surface 
and gently scrapes the foreign body off the cornea with the bevel of the needle. The cornea is quite tough, so isn't damaged. A pulled elbow can usually be manipulated just by pronation and supination. Sometimes it requires full extension, which is more painful. In practice, these two manoeuvres are best done back to back to avoid distress if a click isn't felt just on pronation and supination. To feel the click of the head of the radius slipping back into position, keep your thumb over the head of the radius. If you feel a click, you don't need to go on to the second manoeuvre. Once you're done, leave the child alone for 5-10 to ten minutes to calm down. Ask the parents to tempt them to use it with toys or food. It's very satisfying to return to see a happy child using its arm normally. The phrase trephining describes making a hole in the nail. We need to do this when there's a build-up of pressure from a hematoma under the nail. The patient gets instant pain relief from allowing the blood out. It's quick and satisfying to do. The nail itself is dead so no anaesthetic is needed. The only pain is momentary as the pressure of the device bears down on the nail a second before it burns through. The most important thing in irrigation of a wound is to use large volumes of water. Use a 20 or 50 ml syringe and run the whole lot in. Use pads or a receiving dish to catch the water. Keep repeating the exercise at least five times. This means the bacterial load is very significantly diluted and the body's normal defences can do the rest. When applying adhesive strips, commonly known as steri strips, just be careful how you oppose the wound edges. They should neither be bunched up nor so loose that the gap persists. To help keep the strips in position for the next few days, a supporting strip can be put at right angles on both sides of the wound to hold the edges of the main strips down. Tincture of benzoate is a sticky substance that can help stick them to the skin as well. When gluing a wound, oppose the edges to their final position and then apply the glue over the top. Do not allow the glue to go into the wound itself or it will create a scar. After application, hold your position for a few seconds while it sets. When injecting local anaesthetic, try to minimise pain by doing the following things. Do not use a needle which is too small, it's better to go through the skin fewer times. Inject slowly and inject through the wound edges if it's a clean wound. This is less painful than through intact skin. Lastly, insert your needle into the area that you have just anaesthetised as you work your way down. Here is a wound being sutured. Note the position the needle is held in about two thirds of the way along its length. Now see the distance from the wound edge that the needle should go through. If you are too close, the stitches will pull through. If you are too far away, it will bunch the skin as you pull the suture tight. As you pull the suture through, don't leave a long thread sticking out. Not only does this economise on the number of suture packs you use up, but it keeps your manoeuvres closer to the patient and more controlled. Watch the way the suture holder stays fairly still, while the other hand turns the suture around it. In doing the knot, it is usual to wind the thread round twice and tighten, then wind in the opposite direction as shown and tighten again, then form a third knot in the direction you first started. Lastly, cut the suture so that 2-3mm to three millimeter threads are left sticking up. When dressing the fingers or hand of a toddler, it's important that all your hard work is not wrecked the minute they go home in the car and decide to pull it all off. Watch how these dressings are applied into a toddler-proof arrangement.
Please help my YouTube channel grow. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Did you like the video? Please leave a comment below. Thank you.